All right, here we are, uh, last uh, session for Forbidden Topics. Lessons that will get you criticized, called out, or canceled. This is lesson 13 in the series, and it is entitled Prejudice, Prejudice and the Bible. So in this last lesson in our series, I want to talk about the problem of uh, prejudice in its various uh, forms and what the Bible teaches about this sin. Uh, this is not a lesson where I'm going to be, you know, deconstructing every movement, every social movement out there, every, you know, movement protecting one uh, nationality or another, uh, but rather go about it from the other perspective. What does the Bible say about prejudice, any type of prejudice? And I think if we have that teaching, it'll guide us in all relationships that we have with any, uh, any number of uh, people uh, coming from different uh, cultural uh, backgrounds. Well, first of all, the, um, the uh, word prejudice means to prejudge or to decide in advance. In other words, you judge usually in a negative way and usually based on insufficient, unlimited, excuse me, limited or faulty uh, evidence. There are a lot of kinds of prejudice, uh, gender uh, prejudice, handicap, age, education, economic standards, cultural, political, religious views, you know, people are prejudiced towards all kinds of things. Um, one uh, causing much strife today is racial uh, prejudice. This occurs when someone makes a negative judgment about someone based solely on their cultural background, usually something false or stereotypical about their culture. Uh, different cultures have stereotypes, negative stereotypes. You know, Mexicans, uh, they're lazy or they're ignorant. Um, white people are naturally prejudiced. That's the most popular one today, by the way, that all white people are naturally prejudiced. Uh, blacks uh, are criminals. Uh, black people are un, un, you know, untrustworthy. Uh, or the French are snobs or cowards. Uh, all Asians are good at math. A kind of a reverse, a reverse uh, prejudice. All students are radicals. All politicians are liars. Uh, the police want to kill black men. Uh, Christians are hypocrites. Uh, women of color are sexually immoral. All news media lie or all news media tell the truth. Just some of the uh, prejudice that people can hold today. So there are many types of prejudices in the world, but for the sake of time, I'm going to focus on racial or cultural prejudice because this is the form of prejudice most often mentioned in the Bible. And from this, we can you know, draw lessons to apply to other situations. Of course, the teaching on social prejudice in the Bible can also be applied to all other forms of prejudice as well, as I just noted. It also responds well to the latest arguments concerning racism called the radical race theory, critical race theory, excuse me a theory that declares that all white people are racist, oppressors and unconsciously biased against all other races, especially black people. Uh, this theory is based on declarations and assumptions and manipulation of language. And in response, it would do well uh, to review what the Bible actually teaches about racism and uh, prejudice, because there's a lot out there. Uh, of this particular sin, this particular weakness. So good prejudice in the Bible, first and foremost, always good when we start there. Uh, Exodus chapter 19, verses five and six says, now then if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. So the Jewish people uh, in time uh, kind of 
uh, reinterpreted this passage here to mean that only they were to be with God and that they you know, had a right to look down on others as being uh, unworthy because the promise was for them and God had made them the people of God. And of course, what God wanted from the Jews with that, was that uh, by their holy living and their rich blessings, they would be a light, a shining light to non-believers and consequently draw them to uh, God, not push them away. Now, although God did permit uh, the Jews, uh, or rather he didn't permit the Jews uh, to worship pagan gods or marry pagan women, uh, he did not uh, expl explicitly forbid social contact with Gentiles. I mean, how else to be with them? Jewish rabbis, however, created such strict rules that by the time of Jesus, people would take baths in order to cleanse themselves in case they came in contact with a non-Jew in the marketplace or if they were walking towards someone they knew was not a Jew, they would cross the street so that their shadow would not cross the shadow of the uh, Gentile uh, ind individual. So Jewish people, uh, they loved, uh, helped their own, uh, but were taught to condemn and to despise anyone who wasn't a Jewish. This is the situation that Jesus and the apostles later faced when they began to preach the gospel uh, among the Jews and ran into this problem of prejudice. The New Testament uh, doesn't have a passage that says, uh, thou shalt not uh, be prejudiced. Rather, it gives other general commands and examples that tell us how a Christian is supposed to deal with this issue. For example, we have a command in teaching in Matthew 7, 12. Jesus says, in everything therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. It doesn't get any simpler, does it? There's no complex law here or formulation or theological uh, knot that we have to undo in order to understand a very complicated problem uh, of, uh, of prejudice. In just a few words, Jesus lays it out and helps us understand exactly what our responsibilities are as Christians in this area of loving others. He says, in everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you. For this is the law and the prophets. Pretty simple. Every form of prejudice goes against this rule. And the, 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 the reason for the teaching is twofold. First of all, God is a loving being and he treats everyone with love regardless of who or what they are. And as believers and disciples, he wants us to have his attitude, the attitude that he has towards people. He wants us to have this same type of attitude and uh, loving others, doing to others as we would have them do to us. You know, this is a good uh, teaching that guides us in pretty much all situations. Uh, another reason for the teaching uh, everyone is descendant of Adam. And so no one culture or race is superior to another. I mean, even modern genetic research has shown this to be true. Uh, different cultures began to evolve when God separated the peoples and gave them different languages. And the story behind this is the following, the one in Genesis uh, chapter 11. Let's read that. It says, now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. I want you to keep that in mind. The whole earth used the same language and the same words. It came about as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. They said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone and they used tar for mortar. They said, come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven and let us make for ourselves a name, 
Otherwise we will be scattered abroad over the face of the earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. The Lord said, behold, they are one people and they all have the same language. And this is what they began to do. And now nothing which they purpose will, to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth and they stopped building the city. Therefore its name was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. And so early in man's history, uh, first of all, uh, the writer here, Moses uh, says that everyone spoke the same language. Uh, this would be up until you know, a little while after uh, Noah. Some have uh, suggested that that ancient form of language was an ancient form of uh, Hebrew. God had told them to spread out and to populate the, um, the earth, uh, but they refused and instead they stayed in one place and they started building this huge monument where they could worship idols. This would, monument would represent uh, you know, their earthly kingdom. And so after the flood, they're supposed to separate, they're supposed to you know, reestablish the earth, populate the earth, earth uh, and they refuse to do so. They kind of uh, rather you know, stick together and when they're together, they begin building this monstrosity here. So in order to stop them, God made them start speaking different languages. This confused them and stopped the building of the tower because they couldn't understand each other. These type of towers are called ziggurats. There's still examples of these ancient types of towers uh, in, the, uh, in the Middle East. Well, pretty soon uh, they began to reorganize into groups who spoke the same language and drifted away from each other and began to live in different parts of the uh, world, just as God had originally commanded after the flood. The tower, as I said, was called Babel, uh, which means to mix. And so as these groups separated the variety of climate and food and customs and inbreeding, they experienced uh, and created the genetic differences in physical appearances that we see uh, today. There are some very different looking, sounding and acting people on the earth, but the differences uh, are the result of thousands of years of different experiences. However, the Bible tells us that at one time, all people were the same because they all came from one man and one woman. In the church, people have not always believed this to be so. In the United States and Europe, there was a time when some Christians actually believed that the Bible, talk, the Bible taught that uh, blacks, were inferior. In Genesis 9, 18 to 27, we read the reason for this faulty understanding. It says, now the sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth. And Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah and from these, the whole world uh, was uh, populated. It says, then Noah began farming and planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and uncovered himself inside his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it uh, upon both their shoulders and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were turned away so they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine, he knew what his youngest son had done to him. So he said, cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants he shall be to his brothers. He also said, blessed be the Lord, the, Lord, the God of Shem and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem and let Canaan be his servant. Okay, so there's the curse that he put 
on, uh, on Ham and what he said about uh, the other two of Noah's sons. Uh, and uh, the curse was put on Ham because of the disrespect he showed uh, his family. Now in time, the nations in parts of the Middle East and Africa eventually uh, were believed to be descended from Ham. Uh, his tribe, uh, his people mostly populated these states and this, these, uh, this area of the world where we have uh, quite a number of black people. Some people mistakenly assumed that uh, this particular verse in Genesis meant that the ancestors of Ham would all of them be inferior. In other words, black people would be inferior to whites. That was Ham's curse and that's how they defended it. Of course, the curse was that he, Ham, would not win or become more prosperous than his brothers. That was the curse. Not that his descendants would be inferior to his brother's descendants you know, forever. That, that was a mistaken understanding of that passage. And so this is how many people in the United States and Britain and other countries excused the practice of slavery in this country for many years. And they still felt that they were being good Christians. Well, the Bible says so right there, you know, that blacks are not equal to whites and that gives us the right, you know, it was a very thin, you know, excuse uh, that they were using uh, for their uh, cruelty. But anyways, and so the first thing uh, uh, that the uh, Bible teaches us uh, regarding prejudice is that it goes against God's basic law uh, to love and to treat others like self because God uh, is love and we all come from Adam. So someone said, why, why slavery wrong? Because we're treating another human being who's made in the image of God. We're treating that person improperly. Uh, we're going against God's will uh, in the way we're treating these uh, people as far as uh, the slave runners were concerned. Uh, that goes, of course, for all the, you know, the manners in which we treat uh, other people. Um, the example of Jesus himself also helps us understand uh, this idea of uh, prejudice. Uh, the Old Testament specifically taught that all men were created from one man. And then later in Exodus chapter 19, verses five and six, that God's people were specifically uh, not to make any distinctions. And if this wasn't enough in the New Testament, Jesus gives us the example that teaches us about the equality of people and how Christians should treat um, everyone. The parable of the Good Samaritan shows that Christians are not to treat anyone as inferior. The story is in Luke chapter 10, begins in verse 30. It says, Jesus replied and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers and they stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. And by chance, a priest was going down on that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side, but a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him and when he saw him, he felt compassion. And he came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own beast and brought him uh, to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. And whatever more you spend when I return, I will uh, repay you. So a little background here on the Samaritan story. The Samaritans, of course, uh, were living in the northern part, uh, you know, northern part of Israel. And they were not uh, liked by the Jews who lived in the southern kingdom because uh, they were considered as being half-breeds. When they were carried off into captivity, they were, they were spread uh, unlike the Jews who were taken all of them to uh, Babylon together, and then many of them brought back, the people of the Northern tribes were just spread out 
in all different kinds of countries and different types of tribes. And they were encouraged to remarry, you know, and intermarry with these other tribes. So by the time they began to filter back to their old nation up in the Northern Israel, uh, uh, most of them were, uh, you know, half breeds. They were half Jewish and half uh, something else. And uh, this was not acceptable, of course, to Jews, uh, pure Jews, if you wish, who were in uh, the Southern Kingdom and trying to rebuild the temple and trying to rebuild the city. And so if priests and Levites, uh, another law, uh, touched uh, dead bodies, uh, they would not be able to serve at the temple without going through a special ritual of, cle uh, of cleansing. So it would be an inconvenience to them. However, it says they were going down from Jerusalem. The way it worked, no matter where you lived, if you lived north of Jerusalem or south or east or west, you, it was always said you were going up toward Jerusalem. You always went up towards Ju Jerusalem or down away from Jerusalem, okay? And so the fact that they were going downward meant that these priests, this Levite, they had already been to Jerusalem. They had already done their service at the temple and they were on their way home. So the excuse of maybe touching a dead body or something uh, that would deny them their, uh, you know, their turn at servicing uh, the temple, uh, that, doesn't, uh, that doesn't hold uh, water. Uh, and we don't know what the victim uh, was, just that he was a victim. You know, he had no clothes on, they beat him up, took his clothes off, so no one could, could tell what he was. The point, of course, that Jesus uh, makes is that your neighbor is everybody, not just the person who looks and thinks or uh, believes uh, like you. Jesus says, which of the three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, well, the one who showed mercy toward him. Then Jesus said to him, go and uh, do the same, go and do the same. So the point is that your neighbor is everybody, not just the person who looks and thinks and believes like you. No one is inferior. No, no one is unworthy of receiving love or help or compassion. Jesus died for everyone, black, white, and, and, and people who are uh, in between. We, we don't have uh, equal gifts. We don't have equal abilities, but we are equally valuable in God's eyes and we're worthy of love. You know, mission work, for example, sees every soul of equal, uh, of equal value. And of course, the goal for Christians that we've been given, uh, it says, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ uh, Jesus. In the world, people will either go to war with those who are different, or in a best case scenario, they try to live in peace and accept each other as they are. That's why we have the United Nations, you know, tries to help those types of uh, relationships take place in the world. In the church, however, we go one step further. Our goal in the church is not to win or just tolerate each other or even live in peace. Our goal in the church is to become one, to become united. Once uh, we become uh, Christians. The main identity is not man or woman, or I'm black, or I'm white, or I'm rich, or I'm poor. Our main identity is I'm a Christian, and I accept you because you're a, uh, a Christian. Of course, this passage, it doesn't erase our differences, but it does call on us to be united despite our differences. A better result than the division caused by you know, uh, critical uh, race theory. So uh, prejudice is, is judging without knowing or criticism and rejection based on differences, skin or language or opinion, so on and so forth. What does the Bible teach? First of all, God loves all. And so we should love all. Secondly, all people are related as humans and may have different abilities and opportunities, but all of them are equally valuable in the eyes of God. And thirdly, a Christian's goal is to love all men and be one with all Christians. So this brings us 
together. It doesn't create more division or understanding. If what we're shooting for is unity among ourselves, then you know, we'll gain a portion of unity. We won't fall into disunity and discouragement. So how, uh, you know, this here gives a, a kind of a lesson uh, as to what, you know, what, what are a Christian's responsibility insofar as prejudice is concerned. If prejudice is your problem, a couple of ideas that may help deal with it. First of all, recognize that it's a sin and God will punish you for it. A good motivation uh, to change your attitude is the idea that you know, what you're doing is not according to God's will. Secondly, uh, judge people on what you know, not just what you feel or what others have said about that person. And judge them one person at a time. No person speaks for an entire race. I mean, imagine if we judged all white people according to Hitler. You know, imagine that. Uh, you, we're going to judge. Uh, we're going to judge uh, all Russians according to Mr. Putin, or we're going to judge all Chinese according to uh, Premier Mao. You know, that wouldn't be fair. Of course not. We don't. We don't uh, do that. And of course, uh, realize that nobody's perfect. It's easy to say that, but you know, we have to realize that that's just the truth. Everyone has weaknesses. Have some mercy on others if you want them to have mercy on you. The only prejudice you can eliminate in this world is your own prejudice. It begins with you and that always begins today. So now the, the main problem we as Christians face today is that we are accused of various kinds of prejudice because we reject certain types of behavior, I repeat that, it's very important. One of the main problems today is that we as Christians face uh, uh, prejudice. We're accused of being prejudiced because we reject certain types of behavior. For example, if we hold to the Bible teaching that homosexual practice is wrong, because it's forbidden by the Bible in Romans chapter 1, 26 and 27, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10, 1 Timothy chapter 1, 9 and 10, all clear passages that absolutely forbid homosexual practice. If we reject homosexuality uh, or any sexual practice that goes against Bible teaching, you know, there are too many to mention here. So, We'll say practices that violate the one man, one woman for life principle of marriage. If we say that, then we're accused of being prejudiced. You know, all the quote phobic words for it. You're transphobic, homophobic, you know, whatever. You're something phobic if you say, no, my view of life, of what's right in life is one man, one woman together for life. That's God's plan for marriage. God's plan for sexual unity and expression. If it's gay sex among people of color, uh, then we're racist. You know, if we denounce gay sex among people of color, we're racist. Now they can, uh, accuse us of being too prudish. They can accuse us of being overly zealous or self-righteous. And at least their accusations would be in context. You know, we're judging behavior that is forbidden by the Bible. And since they don't accept the Bible as authority, they reject us as well, as, a, 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 as well as our conclusions concerning their behavior. And this goes for any behavior that is unbiblical in nature and practice. For example, for example, lifting up one race over another race, the KKK or the BLK, BLM rather, you know, one race over another race, or lifting one gender over another, the feminist or LGBTQ plus, you know, 
are always constantly lifting one gender type over another, uh, lifting a political ideology over Christianity by force. You know, that, that's communism and fascism. Uh, lifting an ideology over that which maintains social order and peace. Well, that's, you know, anarchy, social justice warriors, Antifa. But if you, if you speak out about the bad behavior of these people, then uh, you're called a prejudice. And so accusing Christians of prejudice because we call out behavior that is anti-biblical or anti-spiritual or downright sinful is just their way of shutting us up. It's their way of saying, just shut up. We don't want to hear you. There's no faster way of canceling or shutting down a voice proclaiming the gospel or denouncing sin than by labeling that person a racist or telling everybody else that that person is prejudiced, whether you have proof or not, make any difference. So I tell you, as I close out this series of lessons, don't be quiet, continue to speak out. Speak out against prejudice and behave as God has taught us to behave. We are all equally valuable before God. This is the starting point for all human relationships. We are all equally valuable before God. However, not all behavior is equally acceptable before God. Very important. What should we do? Number two, shine, you know, shine the light. Speak out, shine the light on bad behavior and false ideas that you know, run contrary to God's word. Paul says that the church is the pillar and the support of the truth. First Timothy chapter three, uh, verse 15. As Christians, we maintain the truth and we serve God by declaring the truth about all matters, even if that brings pushback and angry but empty you know, uh, accusations of, of, uh, of prejudice or racism. In the end, God who has the knowledge and the right to judge will determine who spoke the truth and who behaved according to his word. Brothers and sisters, so long as we follow his word in how we act and what we say, we should have no fear of either man's or God's judgment. Well, this is the end of our series. I hope that it's been useful and informative for you and edifying. And I thank you for your attention, participation, and I pray that God bless all who are here. And of course, all of those folks who participate with us online throughout the week. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.